Good morning, church. It's a little bit different today. We're doing this all online today because of annual conference, and um, it's great. It's, it's going to be good. I'm excited about our service today. We have a new series that's starting um, as of today, and so the service is going to be a little bit different. Um, but it's a great series. It's called Drawn Into a Creative Life with God. And and living that, and it's all about what we, how we mesh and how we use our creativity to be in connection with God and what that means in our lives. So, all my favorite things, and I'm pretty excited. It's a fun series, and we've got some fun videos. I've been busy doing um, the threshold moment and the videos for you that are included in this service. We've got some great music and we're going to start it today and then we're going to continue this on for the next, it'll be a total of a six week series. So that'll take us through the end of July and I'm excited. I hope you are too. The driven, let us be drawn in. Let your love be a given, let us be drawn in. To imagine, to dream, to create, to redeem. For the sake of the living, let us be drawn in. All creation began with the dream of God, the will and intention for life to exist in the void. All of our actions are born out of desire, out of a dream and a vision for the future. This is our birthright, to imagine and to create what brings us alive, what truly moves your soul in the deepest way. What you create out of that answer is your greatest gift to the world and the way in which you are part of God's unfolding and ongoing creative dream. In the world of the driven, let us be drawn in. Let your love be a given, let us be drawn in. To imagine, to deem, to create, to redeem, for the sake of together. Creating God, you called forth all that exists in a moment of divine brilliance. Open us again to that spark which you ignited in each of us at our creation, so that we might generate more life-giving energy in this world. Draw us into your story of hope. Give us the courage to dream. Seek 
Join me in the prayer of confession. What holds us back from the joy of our creativity? Social activist Dorothy Day said, God is our creator. God made us in God's image and likeness, therefore we are creators. The joy of creativeness should be ours. Sometimes, what holds us back in not believing that we are a child of God? Many of us think, oh, I'm not creative. In the silence, think of what you like to create. It could be typically artistic writing or painting, but it could also be something like baking, fixing the car, playing with the kids, decorating the house, making someone smile, or the things you do in your work. What do you like to make in this world? Let's take a moment of silent confession. Hear the good news. Know that you are creative simply because you were created by God. I'm going to read a piece by Martha Graham called There is a Vitality. There is a vitality, a life force, an energy, a quickening that is translated through you into action. And because there is only one of you in all of time, this expression is unique. And if you block it, the world will not have it. It is not your business to determine how good it is, nor how valuable, nor how, or how it compares with other expressions. It is your business to keep it yours clearly and directly, to keep the channel open. Whether you choose to take an art class, keep a journal, record your dreams, dance your story, or live each day from your own creative source. Above all else, keep the channel open. God, fill our hearts to reach out in welcome. Make us to see your vision once more. Let's dream of a world where our hands are your hands. We offer ourselves. Oh God, make it so. Make it so. Make it so. We pray for the day. We dream for a world where love reigns among us and your will is done. Oh God, make it so. And now let us come into a time of meditation. And if you're comfortable doing so, close your eyes for just a moment so you can do some visualizing. Breathe in slowly and let your breath out slowly. 
again coming in and out. Imagine that your stresses, your anxieties, your deadlines are all rolling off your head and down your shoulders, down your arms and falling away to the floor. See a blue sky above you, an incredible sunny blue sky day. When you think of the sky's the limit, what do you imagine? What would you do if you could dream up anything for this town, this world, this community? Take a moment to write that down. It can be a word, a phrase, or whole sentences expressing a desire, a dream, something that you would want to help create if you could. And let us join now in the prayer that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. We will read this morning from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 4, verses 13 through 21. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news about him spread throughout the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues and was praised by everyone. Jesus went to Nazareth, where he had been raised. On the Sabbath, he went to the synagogue, as he normally did, and stood up to read. The synagogue assistant gave him the scroll from the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the prisoners and recovery of sight to the blind, to liberate the oppressed and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the synagogue assistant and sat down. Every eye in the synagogue was fixed on him. He began to explain to them Today, this scripture has been fulfilled just as you heard it. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, our strength and our redeemer. Amen. In the Gospel of Luke, Jesus gives us a glimpse of the magnitude of God's playing field when he preaches for the first time in the synagogue of his hometown of Nazareth. At first, all the people speak well of him. They marvel at this kid from their very own neighborhood speaking so eloquently in the synagogue. Isn't he Joseph's son? They ask each other amazed by his words. It's like they can barely restrain themselves from pinching his cheeks. But Jesus doesn't give them the kind of congratulatory sermon that they're looking for. He doesn't assure them that God is on their side and their side only. Instead, he reminds them of an old story of the prophet Elijah, who ministered to the widow in Zarephath, 
And Elisha's met protege, Elisha, who cleans the Ammon, the Syrian, from leprosy. See, these stories sound sweet and harmless to us today, but in Jesus' time, they had an edge. Those were examples of God helping foreigners, outsiders, the ones that they had been taught were unclean and unworthy of God's favor. Jesus notes that even though there were plenty of starving widows in Israel in Elijah's, time, Elijah's day, God called, the widow that God called Elijah to save was an outsider. God was dreaming bigger than just one nation. God was dreaming for the entire human race. See, this is why the mood of Jesus' crowd swiftly goes from admiring to adversarial when we, he reminds them of these stories. See, Jesus isn't just playing lip service to God's dream for the world. He actually expects them to expand their own vision and to do something about it. So the same people who were cooing over him moments before now haul him out of the synagogue and try to throw him off of a cliff. That's how threatened they were by Jesus' message of inclusion, of releasing the captives and of letting the oppressed go free, not just for the people of Israel, but for everyone. God's dream is so large. How can God expect any of us to take all of the issues that Jesus lays out in his ministry? Solving poverty, releasing the captives, healing the sick, freeing the oppressed. You can get tired just listing the categories. So the way we live God's dream is to not to take on every single issue that God feels is important. Rather, we get deeply in touch with what stirs our soul. And then we devote our life energies to doing that soul-stirring work. While the human soul pays attention to things like paychecks, and it desires far more th things far more significant than just money. Once the soul is assured of the basic survival of the physical body that it hosts it, it quickly turns to other matters, to the need to give and to receive love and grace and forgiveness, the need to belong in a community with others, and the need to serve a cause that transcends physical survival. If these needs happen to be met through our vocation, we can work incredibly hard and never feel like we get tired. However, if the work that we do is not meeting that soul need, we can work as tenth of, as hard, and the only thing we'll dream about is how to do less of it. In Washington State, there's two brothers who own a car repair shop called Simba's Automotive. For years, these brothers have been treating automobiles and their drivers with such a high level of care and respect that you practically want your car to break down just so that you can experience Simba's way. Yelp reviews show people still raving about the business even after all these years. One reviewer said that she brought her car into Simba's for one problem only to discover that they had fixed another one also and had done so for free. It just needed to be done, they explained. That's Simba's. Years ago, someone asked one of the owners what made the business tick. And he responded, see, my brother and I are Muslim. We treat every automobile as if Mohammed himself were to drive it away. These two brothers were living God's dream, not merely their own. Much like Jesus, suggested in recounting the stories of helping outsiders, yet living God's dream meant their souls were ablaze with passion and with compassion as well. 
To me, this is the essence of ministry. Ministry isn't about who wears the robes, but who lives the life. You can be a minister without ever preaching Jesus or Mohammed to the recipients of your labors. You simply need to treat them as if they were the embodiment of your Lord. When Jesus said, whatever you do to the least of my people, you do to me. He meant it. We see this sometimes in the healing professions. Someone who has found their sweet spot or calling in the healthcare industry. They never need to preach Jesus to their patients to be deeply involved in Christian ministry. They practice a quieter gospel by treating their patients with the same respect and dignity as they would if their patient was Jesus. They not only live within God's dream, but they make God's dream a reality. For instance, a cardiac surgeon who treats her patients as she would treat Jesus does not view them merely as patients, but as people. They're not defined by their condition any more than Jesus would be if he had heart disease. And if Jesus was entering the hospital, she would not simply be concerned with the level of care that he received in her office, but how the whole hospital treated him. She might not even stop there, especially since her soul was attached to both her work and to Jesus. If her patient were truly Jesus, she might ask how the healthcare system as a whole was treating him. And if the answer was poorly, she might be moved to do something about it. In this church, we can see firsthand how John Camphouse's dream of feeding the hungry became the perfect sweet spot, the perfect calling for both him and for those in the church and the larger community who shared his vision. It is a channel through which their love and energy is offered to the world. As the church pledged to come alongside the effort, they found the tools and the resources to make a difference in the community. The soup kitchen staff and the supporting UMSS leadership continues to reflect theologically on what it means to treat our guests as if they were Jesus himself. See, these are the real ministers, not ordained ministers who preach, but ministers of the quiet gospel who are modeling Simba's way. John has shared with me that when he first heard the calling to start the soup kitchen, he didn't know how he was going to pull it off. And while he had plenty of ideas, the dream was far too big for one person to do alone. Well, if anything happens, when you seek to live within God's dream, rather than making God live within yours. See, God isn't limited by your intelligence or your imagination. God isn't even limited by your perception of the available resources. Simply put, God is able to, to be a more creative participant in helping you fulfill God's dream than you ever imagined. Dreaming God's dream also engages you with others who are trying to dream God's dream as well. And so what is your dream? What is your sweet spot? Where are the gifts and graces that you have? How can they be offered up to others as if they were offered to Christ himself? Where are you being called to be a minister of the quiet gospel? A minister of auto mechanics, a minister of feeding, a minister of care, Minister of gardening, a minister of grandparenting, a minister of justice and inclusion, affirmation. How can we live into God's dream? What are the various ways that we can treat the recipients of our labor as if they were given to Jesus himself? through our vocation, and through our avocation. I invite us to dream together for how our church can embody a model for ministry that understands that lay people 
Having callings is what's critical in the fulfillment of God's dream on earth. It is, as, it is as critical as any ordained clergy. See, lay people are on the forefront and the front lines of the inbreaking of God's realm, not in the back seat. Be not content simply to proclaim God's dream. Go out and live it. For your ministry, in fact, goes a long way to fulfilling the dream Jesus proclaimed in the fourth gospel of Luke. Amen. see the unfolding of each day as an opportunity to be a co-creator with God. As a Jesus follower, may you feel his company leading you towards creating more kindness, justice, and mercy. May you know the nudge of the creative spirit within, making belief in all that you are and all that you do. Go in peace. Go with God. Amen.